My name's Colin Marshall. This is the Marketplace of Ideas. This week, a conversation about consciousness, free will, toilet training, and man-animal hybrids with David P. Barish, professor of psychology at the University of Washington, author of Natural Selection, Selfish Altruists, Honest Liars, and Other Realities of Evolution. The fact that that Homo sapien, perfectly good primate, is capable of being toilet trained is something to celebrate. By which, yeah. I, And I don't just mean in terms of sort of daily hygiene, but in terms of what it says about our ability to modify our behavior once the issues are made clear to us. So I, as an evolutionary biologist, as well as a peace activist, frankly, remain somewhat optimistic that a species of primate that can be toilet trained could eventually be planet trained, too. Every single interview from the Marketplace of Ideas is available on our online archive. Visit us at www.colinmarshallradio.com slash marketplace. You can download each show, or you can stream any of them in your browser. Join the International Marketplace of Ideas listening community by adding yourself to our Frapper listener map. The link is right on our front page, colinmarshallradio.com slash marketplace. My guest is David P. Barish, professor of psychology at the University of Washington. His books include The Myth of Monogamy, The Mammal in the Mirror, and Madame Bovary's Ovaries. His new book is Natural Selections, Selfish Altruists, Honest Liars, and Other Realities of Evolution. David, welcome to the Marketplace of Ideas. Hi, Colin. My pleasure. Now, the first thing I want to do is to clear up a little terminology issue. In your bios, you're put down as on the van, as having been on the vanguard of sociobiology when it started out in the 1970s. But you mentioned in the book that the terminology has come along to evolutionary psychology. Are those the same things? I think they are essentially the same things. I mean, there are, there are a number of my colleagues who would disagree, um, those in, in psychology departments who sort of identify themselves as psychologists, like to think that evolutionary psychology is something altogether new. Um, I'm actually trained as a biologist. My degree is in zoology, although I'm a professor of psychology at University of Washington, so I kind of span the two fields. As far as I'm concerned, really, evolutionary psychology is simply applying the basic ideas of evolution, what uh, some time ago was called sociobiology, to human beings. Um, and I don't think there's any more meaningful distinction than that. I, ha I have to add, there are people who developed a rather negative feeling about the phrase, the word sociobiology because of the political attacks that were launched against it. And so I think there was a feeling among some people that, well, if we get a new word, maybe we can start afresh in terms of avoiding some of the ill feelings that few people had. But I think that's, uh, I, don't, I think it's a distinction without a difference. When you talked about the political troubles the word sociobiology got into, what happened there? Well, it's a long story, but there was, I mean, part of it was, I think, frankly, just a uh, matter of, personal animosity within some of the Harvard faculty at the time. Edward O. Wilson wrote the book titled Sociobiology, which really synthesized a lot of important concepts in evolution and ecology and applied them to social behavior. And a number of his sort of colleagues, competitors, also at Harvard were, were upset with that and I think were somewhat competitive with him. So there's a, there was a uh, distinctly personal element to it. But beyond that, the, um, the political complaints, a lot of it had to do with essentially what was perceived as conservative left-wing, conservative versus left-wing politics. Many of the critics were very much on the left, and they considered that sociobiology was somehow a right-wing conspiracy, <laughs> uh, which I, I agree. I laughed at it, too, and I think it's absurd. I'm, frankly, about as far left as you can get in the United States, and have been very much an advocate of evolu I mean, evolution applied to behavior. And what's particularly ironic here, Colin, is that if you look at what happened when Darwin's work was initially becoming known in the middle of the 19th century, it was considered 
an enormous threat to the existing social order. It was considered wildly revolutionary. Shaking up the establishment. Exactly. Well, not only sh sh shaking it up in terms of existing ideas, but you have to remember at that time in Europe, uh, Europe had been really convulsed by a number of revolutions, I think a number of them around 1848, and uh, the, 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 the monarchies were feeling really threatened. And an, a notion that said that life is in a state of constant flux, rather than being as it is because of the uh, unalterable word of God, was enormously threatening. And indeed, Marx wanted to um, um, to inscribe uh, Capital to Darwin, uh, dedicated to Darwin. So that it's quite ironic that um, about 150 years later, um, evolutionary thought applied to behavior. I don't think it's either right-wing or left-wing. I think it's simply an important, insightful way to look at things. So it, at the beginning, this, the thought was considered, it was considered to be anti-establishment and then a tool of the establishment later on? That's right, yeah. Huh. I think in more recent years, it's been considered a tool. And I think, at least by some people, and I, I think what they're trying to get at, what, what's motivating them, is concern that if we study the way human behavior works, and we interpret, in some sense, certain aspects of our behavior as, quote, natural, as reflecting our underlying biology, that that somehow means that it's good. You know, that, that somehow to understand the underlying biology behind our behavior is to support the, somehow the propriety of that behavior. And that's what you call the naturalistic fallacy, correct? Yeah, exactly. I'm not the only one who's used that yeah. term. But but I think it's an important and very widespread misconception, Colin, because, I mean, take, take an analogy, say, from medicine. Uh, when physicians study tuberculosis or AIDS, it's not because they're in favor of tuberculosis or AIDS, and yet what could be more natural than a virus or a bacterium? Yeah. The whole idea is to understand natural phenomena so as, in many cases, so as to, strike, to, to, to struggle against them. And I actually argue that many things in our behavior um, are as natural as can be, but that doesn't mean that they're good. <laughs> and indeed, if we're going to have any power over these things, particularly some of these inclinations that are not so pleasant, then it's all the more important that we understand where they're coming from. Not because we're in favor of them. In many cases, it's because we're opposed to them. And correct me if I'm wrong, but one of your major themes in this new book is that one of the defining elements of humanity is the struggle against natural inclinations. I would argue that, for mm. sure. Yes, I, I think... I mean, if you look at other animals, um, it's, hard to, it's hard to conclude that any other animals have the opportunity to behave counter to their inclinations, unless they're really forced to do so, let's say, by human beings. Whereas I think humans, perhaps the unique quality that we have is the opportunity, and I would even say in some cases the ethical obligation, to behave against our inclinations. But in order to do that, first maybe we need to understand what those inclinations are and then sort of look at them objectively and say, well, is this something, this, I may be inclined to do this, is this something that I really think I ought to do? How much does the idea that we shouldn't look too closely at how we evolved and the explanations for our behavior. How much has that idea, how much progress has that idea made? How much of an inroad has that idea made in terms of influencing people who would teach evolutionary biology? Is it, is it something that can be disregarded as not a danger, or is it a real danger? It's, that's hard to say. I think it's a real danger in some cases. I think the greater danger, frankly, at this point, is not so much a reluctance to look into our behavior because of political concerns as such, than it is a reluctance on the part of um, roughly, or no, I shouldn't say a reluctance, a refusal on the part of roughly 50% of the American people, for instance, to countenance the idea of evolution at all. I think the biggest problem is the sort of the political, religious orientation, particularly in the United States, that makes us in many ways a, an astoundingly backward country, as a matter of fact. It's the prevalence of the idea that something else some other way of thinking should be considered other than evolution as far as the origin of humanity. 
Well, not just some other way, and I'll yeah. be more specific. Maybe you're being, being delicate. I mean, specifically <laughs> thinking in terms of the Bible. Oh, okay, the Bible. Yeah, I mean, that, that you know, the whole notion of special creation and a refusal to, to accept what everything in biological science tells us, and that notion that human beings must be so special that we are not part of the natural world and that we're not subject to the same principles that all other living things are. I think that's not only bizarre and absurd and goes counter to everything we know in biology, but I think it's really dangerous. I think that's been the, that's one of the, perhaps the most hurtful myth of all time. This sort of human exceptionalism? Exactly. Exactly. Now let's talk a little bit about how this book came to be. It started as a series of columns for the Chronicle of Higher Education, and how did those start up? Let me think. I'm trying, I'm trying to remember. Actually, I was originally contacted by the editor there, Malcolm Scully, um, after an article that I had written in another journal, and I can't even remember what the article was. And he just sent me a very complimentary email and asked me if I would like to consider writing for the Chronicle. And uh, I was delighted to do so. It's been, it's been a really lovely experience. It's been going on now about six or seven years. Um, and they give me quite a bit of freedom to talk about or to write about almost anything that, that catches my eye and my, uh, w within the basic framework of evolutionary biology, particularly evolutionary biology applied to, to human behavior. Did they say in that field, just write about whatever you think might be relevant to a reader? Um, well, yeah. I mean, they're open to anything I come up with. It doesn't mean that they guarantee that they'll, that they'll do it. You know, like any other journal, I think they have, they have an editorial process, and I have had a few pieces turned down, somewhat to my chagrin. <laughs> <laughs> Was there any, any clear reason for it, or just they weren't feeling like it that time? I think sometimes it's just they weren't feeling like it at that time. There's one piece I, I was just thinking of now... Um, that I was somewhat surprised and a little disappointed that they rejected it. hasn't actually seen print yet. was um, a piece I wrote about spectator sports. Oh, really? Yeah, which was very critical of spectator sports. <laughs> the whole phenomenon of spectatorship. And I drew a number of parallels between human tendency as on occasion to um, observe without participating to the situation that we observe in certain, among certain animals. It's very odd. I think in some ways... Spectator sports is one of the uh, the great sort of unacknowledged religious traditions in the United States, and maybe even more a taboo than evolution. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a column I would like to see. Do you think there in the future there will be a book just containing the columns that didn't make it into the Chronicle? <laughs> Perhaps so. <laughs> I think that'd be fun, sort of evolutionary remainders, or what, I don't know. You can come up with a clever title for it, but I think there'd be a readership for that. Yeah. <laughs> It could be kind of a, a contrarian take on <laughs> even, well, actually, even more dangerous book, ideas. Yeah, well, this book, uh, Natural Selections, actually is, is pretty contrarian in itself, I think, for many people. So we'll, we'll, see, we'll see how the reading public responds to that. <laughs> and I want to ask about that. There's a lot of books out there on evolution, on evolutionary psychology. There's, it's a l pretty large field. It's been growing, as you well know. What is different about your views on the subject? Well, I think what I've, what I've tried to do here is, um, well, I know what I've tried to do, whether I've succeeded, I guess, <laughs> another question, <laughs> but is to, is to look at, well, to examine those consequences of evolution for human, human beings in particular, for human beings' understanding of an image of themselves those consequences that, it, that go beyond simply giving mere lip service to evolution. Because again, as, I, as we just mentioned, about 50% of the American public doesn't even accept evolution at all. And I'm not really writing for them any more than I would be writing for members of the Flat Earth Society. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm really talking to the other half, the half that are educated, that are somewhat informed and open-minded. But my point is that even within that group, there's only a very small number who have actually been willing to follow out the implications, or inclined to follow out the implications of evolution um, that go beyond simply, simply giving mere lip service. So that's what I'm trying to do in the book, is look at some of these often uncomfortable consequences of evolution uh, that, that people have often been unable to accept or unable to even acknowledge. 
So you think that maybe too many writers on, too many popular writers on evolution have just been stating that evolution is the case and leaving it at that? Yeah, and they've been doing that, and they've been looking at the ev evolutionary uh, interpretations of certain very specific things, certain organ systems, fossil history. But they haven't looked, for instance, at, well, I mean, the, the first chapter in this book is called Seductions of Centrality. And in it, I approach that the phenomenon that is so widespread among most people, even if they do accept evolution, which is that somehow human beings are the center of the universe, at least conceptually, if not, if not astronomically. As we were talking about the human exceptionalism of before? Exactly, okay. yeah. yeah, And that human beings are so special, and that often that they themselves are so special. Ah. You know, the notion that, that somehow the, the, the cosmos is organized with them in mind, and uh, again, a, a sincere look at evolutionary biology suggests that's a very hard issue to maintain. The issue of human centrality, the mindset of human centrality, has been hard for even evolution-accepting atheists to shake them. I believe that's true. Oh. That's right. The notion that there must be meaning in life. I see. Um, this is such a widespread idea, and yet when you stop and think about it, it's utterly absurd. <laughs> Why should there be any more meaning in your life or my life than there is in the life of uh, a hippopotamus or a butterfly? Um, truth is, you and me and the hippopotamus and the butterfly were, quote, created when the mother's egg was fertilized by the father's sperm. Could have been any of a bazillion sperms. The individual then developed, it lives its life, and then it dies, and it behaves in the interim. But the notion that there is somehow a special consequence to any of these fertilized eggs is, I think, you know, it may be self-gratifying for many people, but I think it has no basis whatsoever in science. What do you think people are asking for when they're asking for a meaning of life? Because um, tell me if you found this, but I don't know that people who say they, they're looking for the meaning of life have even very well defined the concept of meaning. Well, I think you're right there, Colin. It's become something of a cliché. But I think, I think what they're looking for is, in fact, what they, in many ways what they claim they're looking for, a meaning in their lives. But I fear that they often make a rather huge blunder by assuming that that meaning is somehow out there in the universe to be imposed upon them or something that a creator had in mind. By contrast, I think, I think a... Um, a serious immersion in evolution suggests really the wisdom behind the existentialist, the existentialist argument that says there is no inherent meaning in your life or in my life or in anyone else's life any more than there is in the life of a redwood tree or a Galapagos tortoise. The meaning then, if we want meaning, and human beings do seem to seek it, at least many of us do, the answer then, and I think the existentialist in this case had it right, is how we choose to live our lives. What I think, in a, really, I, I think a significant philosophical implication of biology here is that given that there is no inherent meaning in life, if we want meaning, if we want to live meaningful lives, then it's up to us to do so by how we choose to live, not to look for how, their li how one's life has been foreordained or organized according to some divine plan. Now, you have a book, a chapter in this book, excuse me, a chapter in the book about, maybe not union, but the association of existentialism and sociobiology, and not two topics that pop up in people's minds as being associated. How did you come to bring them together? <laughs> well, I think it's really a consequence of my own longstanding interest in both. Uh, I've been fond of existentialism for several decades now, uh, ever since I was introduced to it, I guess, in the 1960s, as I've been fond of evolutionary biology for about equally long time. And as one looks at it, I think that one sees that there are, there are a number of parallels, um, of which I think the most important is this notion of meaning. You know, the existentialists are terribly concerned about meaninglessness. And we have this image of the, the classic existentialist, existential angst, uh, anxiety about, uh, you know, this huge, uh, uncaring universe and how to make one's life consequential 
in, in, in view of that. And again, for biology, if you look around, that's, that's what we find the same situation. There's this huge, this huge universe which is really not caring about any one of us or any species or any creatures, any individual creature. In fact, if you look at what biology is all about from an evolutionary perspective, insofar as there's meaning there at all, it's not the kind of thing that's very satisfying. Namely, it's genes jousting with each other to project themselves or copies of themselves into the future. Hmm. Ultimately, reproductive success of individuals or even more so their genes, which is not really meaning in the, in the, in the satisfying human sense. It's simply a mechanism. It's mechanistic. It's how natural selection works. And indeed, I would argue, sort of, to go back to our earlier discussion about, about um, some of the issues about what's good or what's bad uh, in human life, if you will, or in biology, in a world of, what, six and a half billion people right now, I think already horribly and dangerously overpopulated, the last thing we should do is follow that, those biological, I don't mean to call them imperatives, because they're it was an imperative we would have to follow it, but those biological inclinations of living things to maximize their genetic success, maximize their representation in the future. I think we desperately need to call a halt to that. Um, Is that the most important biological instinct to tone down, if we can? Well, I think in the long run, probably yes. Yes, in the long run. I think the planet, our planet is... is um, endangered by many things, and if we're able to deal with many of the short-term threats, the long-term threat is essentially connected with overpopulation. But in the short-term, Colin, there are all sorts of much more immediate and pressing threats, not the least of which, of course, is nuclear war. Mm. We could kill ourselves and destroy the planet, essentially, in a heartbeat. And nuclear arms has been a big interest of yours, especially publishing-wise. I mean, you've had multiple books on this subject, right? Yes, I have. I have. My wife and I have been very involved in anti-nuclear issues for about 20, almost 30 years now. Um, Is it the biggest threat? I think it's the biggest, most immediate threat, yes, um, in, in that there's nothing else that could literally end life on Earth tomorrow or this afternoon, uh, like I said, in a heartbeat. Um, it's not the only threat. I mean, obviously, long-term or even sort of medium-term climate change is, is a huge threat right now. So global warming would have to be very high on the list of threats, along with other forms of atmospheric and, and uh, sort of global pollution. And, and incidentally, if you put all these together, Colin, I think there's another important bit of evolutionary thinking that plays into this, which is the the conflict between our biological evolution and our cultural evolution. Oh, yes, a huge theme in this book. Yeah. And actually, that's, I think the concluding chapter, as I recall. Yeah. Um, I forget what it's titled, something like Evolution... Evolution's Odd Couple. Odd Couple, there you go. The Odd Couple is, in my mind, the hare and the tortoise, if you will all of which, and I don't mean the literal, the biological hair and the reptile tortoise, but, but I mean these as metaphors for what's going on within us, within ourselves. That on the one hand, we are perfectly good biological critters, just like any other. We're the product of Darwinian evolution, which works by differential reproduction of individuals and their genes. And it progresses very slowly over millennia and then some. And that's the tortoise, and that's a big part of us. But at the same time, we are also subject to cultural evolution, which proceeds in a whole different way. It's really a Lamarckian process. It involves kind of the inheritance of acquired characteristics, but inheritance here isn't genetic. It's really cultural inheritance. This is so evolution not limited to generations. It doesn't just move by the, the birth of a new, the birth or death, rather, of a new organism. Exactly, exactly. It works by... You, we, we pick up an idea, we learn something, we develop a new device, we may tinker with it, we may not. Someone else will ob obtain it as well and pass it along. I mean, Alexander Graham Bell invented the telephone in, what, 18, I think 1870s or 1880s. Um, if that had been a genetic innovation, then only his descendants would use telephones today. And so maybe there'd be 100 or so. And so we're, we're the product, of, again, to, to get back to the hair and the tortoise thing, 
on the one hand, we're plodding along like tortoises biologically, but on the other, at the same time, we're zooming ahead like the hare in terms of the cultural innovations, the new technology. And I think a big part of our problems as, as a species as well as as individuals is that they're both us. We're both the hare and the tortoise, and we, are, we subject ourselves to circumstances and situations for which our biology has ill-prepared us. And indeed, sometimes not only ill-prepared us, it actually prepares us to work in the wrong direction. And so I, I think you can understand some of our problems dealing with nuclear war, with uh, issues of environmental pollution in those terms. What else happens as a result of this cultural evolution outpacing our biological evolution? What, what happens is, essentially is that we are, we are really strangers in a strange land, the strange land being one that we produce ourselves. Let me give you an example. Um, if you look at muskox, wonderful creatures, they look like great shaggy bison of the northern tundra. And when they're approached by their predators, which have been wolves for millennia, the, 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 the muskox assume a very appropriate defensive posture. They orient themselves like spokes of a wheel, sort of aiming outward with, the, with their heavy horns and sharp, sharp uh, points at the end. Uh, so, and and, and the, the, the baby's all in the middle. And so the, the wolves really have a very hard time making a kill. They can do so on occasion, but it's very difficult, a very effective defense. These days, however, the major predators for muskox are no longer wolves, but rather human beings armed with high-powered hunting rifles and riding snowmobiles. Uh, but the muskox do the same thing they always used to. They form their trusty defensive circle, which is, again, the perfect thing to do against wolves, the worst possible thing you could do against humans with rifles, and they all get shot. Yeah. Probably the best thing a muskox could do under that circumstance would be to take off, to run over, the, you know, disappear over the horizon. But their biological evolution inclines them to behave in the way they always have in the past. Now, I think in many ways human beings are both the muskox and the hunters. Um, and again, to get back to the issue of nuclear weapons, which does concern me a lot and I think should concern everyone, uh, the year after the incineration of Hiroshima, Albert Einstein sent a famous telegram to the world's physicists in which he said, among other things, that the splitting of the atom has changed everything except our way of thinking, and thus we drift toward unparalleled catastrophe. Well, one could say the invention of the high-powered hunting rifle and the snowmobile has changed everything except the muskox's way of thinking, and they drift toward unparalleled catastrophe. They're an endangered species now. Um, and so it's really up to human beings when we're in a, a situation that we invent things that change everything except our way of thinking, because our way of thinking is the tortoise, if you will. Oh, I see. We are muskoxen in the world of nuclear weapons? Exactly. Mm. We're muskoxen in the world of nuclear weapons, and yet, of course, we're both the muskoxen and the creatures who've produced the nuclear weapons. And so we're, we're, we're stuck in, in a situation where we're behaving with outmoded strategies, outmoded responses to things that are brand new. The outmoded responses because of our biology, the things that are brand new have to do with, among other things, our weaponry or our ability to, to spew forth vast amounts of greenhouse gases, any number of things like that. You see, let, let me continue another, if I, if I could, another animal metaphor. Think about something like a rattlesnake. Now, rattlesnakes, of course, have very sharp teeth and venom. The venom is poisonous. That's how they get their food. But the venom is also poisonous to other rattlesnakes. And yet, when rattlesnakes fight other rattlesnakes, they don't bite each other. They basically raise themselves up on their ventral uh, sides, uh, essentially each trying to push the other one over. Um, the one who succeeds is the one who wins, and the other one crawls away. Now, one might ask, why don't they bite each other? Well, of course, it, it would be lethal if they were to do so, and the genetic consequences of that would be hurtful for many of the rattlesnakes because they may wind up injuring or killing their own relatives. And so rattlesnakes, with the ability to kill, this high level of lethality, 
refrain from doing so. Now, humans, look, look at humans by contrast. In many ways, we're not like rattlesnakes. We don't have the built-in biologically evolved capacity to kill each other very easily. You know, an, uh, a naked, unarmed human being would have a heck of a time killing another, not to mention killing hundreds or dozens or thousands or tens of thousands. And so we, do, we have not evolved the inhibitions against doing so. And yet at this point, we have evolved because of our culture, the ability, in fact, to kill in vast numbers at a great distance. Um, but we have not been equipped with the inhibitions that the rattlesnake has. For those just tuning in, my guest is David P. Barish, sociobiologist and professor of psychology at the University of Washington. His new book is Natural Selections, Selfish Altruists, Honest Liars, and Other Realities of Evolution. Could cultural evolution solve this problem in any respect? Could there be a further evolution of culture to where we get a grip on this? Or, Well, you know, that's kind of the $64,000 question. I think one thing we know for sure is that biological evolution could not. But again, it's like the tortoise. It creeps along at a very slow and steady pace. So the only way we're going to get somewhere is going to have to do with our culture. It's going to have to do with people understanding their own natures um, and understanding the dangers that they pose to themselves and others. And in the hopes that maybe our big brains will will serve us well. I mean, it's our big brains that's enabled us to invent the amazing technology that, in many ways, is just wonderful, like antibiotics and, and being, you know, just creativity to compose symphonies. But that also threatens us with things like nuclear weapons or greenhouse gases. And so, uh, I'm I am frankly desperately hoping that our big brains will ride to the rescue because our our evolution, as such, is not going to. Okay, brains, you've gotten us into trouble. Now you got to get us out. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know that reminds me, Colin. There was a there was a cartoon I saw quite a while ago that shows um, the purported end of the world. Okay, and, and a series of panels, I guess. And and the world there's been World War Three, and the world has been reduced to basically sort of a nuclear ashtray. And then somewhere deep down in the uh, bowels of the, the ocean depth, a group of surviving protoplasmic creatures are gathering together, and they're having a little confab, and they decide, okay, we're going to try again. But they make a, uh, uh, they pass a resolution first. That is, this time, no brain. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. We'll get it right this time. Don't involve yeah, such a big brain. Right just we'll push each other out of the way like snakes, and then we'll be done with it. <laughs> yeah, well, but I, I mean, the reality is we have to rely on our brains. Yeah. Our brains got us into some of this fix. And our brains help us in all sorts of ways. Um, uh, I, I, I would like to think that our brains can help us out, too. You have a chapter in the book, speaking of thought, about our reasoning and animal cognition and about the continuum between those. What point did you want to make about that? Well, essentially, again, it's, it's a uh, sort of a shot across the bow, if you will, for those people who um, refuse to accept the notion of continuity. Um, and the basic, basic take-home message, more than any other, I think, from evolution, is that of continuity, that of continuity among all living things. And I think it's, it's important, then, for people to understand that the the cognitive abilities of animals are far greater than that which many people are inclined to acknowledge. Um, although I should say there's, there's, they're kind of extremes. I mean, there are people on one end who sort of think that 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 uh, cockroaches must have you know enormous intellect, right? <laughs> and, and that uh, you know pigs may be some of the world's finest philosophers, and that their cat knows everything that's going on. Clearly, that's not true either. But I think what's perhaps more dangerous is the, are those who are inclined to totally disregard the, the sensibilities of animals um, and who don't accept the degree to which we are we not only share our planet in terms of living space and use of resources, but we also share varying degrees of awareness. And that leads into a really fascinating evolutionary question, I think, which is that whole notion of consciousness. Possibly the big question. 
Well, it's certainly, it's certainly the big, one of the big questions in terms of current biological research. It's an interesting thing because for a very long time, consciousness was kind of the third rail of biological research. You don't touch it <laughs> because you couldn't get anywhere with it. You know, maybe the philosophers would, but not the hard nosed scientists. These days, that's changed. Neurobiology of consciousness has become one of the more exciting, well funded uh, areas of research. But at the same time, I think it's quite interesting that there's been very little attention to the question not of how does consciousness happen, although that is probably what you meant, what most people mean when we talk about biology of consciousness, but rather the evolutionary question, which is why does consciousness happen? How did it get there in the first place? Yeah, how did it get there in the sense of what is the, as biologists would say, what is the adaptive significance of consciousness? How, I mean, presumably, given that consciousness has evolved, the question would arise, or could or should arise, what is the benefit of consciousness? How, why has evolution favored, in some ways, consciousness over a lesser degree of consciousness? It seems pretty clear that various animals have a lesser degree of consciousness. It's hard for me to imagine that an amoeba has much consciousness, any at all, or even an earthworm. Now, as you progress to animals with larger and larger brains, there seems less and less doubt that, that the animals certainly are, are, are more and more aware, and I would guess more and more inclined toward consciousness, too. Um, of course, it's a great mystery because we can never really get inside the heads of other animals. But nonetheless, that, that whole question of what, what is the adaptive significance of consciousness, I think is a fascinating one, and one that evolutionary biologists have just begun to think about. Is consciousness... Uh, the degree of consciousness that we possess as humans, is that a side effect of our large brains, of our pure mental horsepower? Well, it certainly could be, and that would be, um, if one is to investigate this as an evolutionary biologist, that would be perhaps one of what, what we would call the null hypothesis. You assume that maybe there isn't much going on here of evolutionary consequence. I mean, maybe, maybe consciousness has evolved simply as a result of what happens when you pile up enough neurons. Uh, and you may pile up the neurons for some other reason, maybe to control a complicated body, for instance, or just to organize uh, responses to circumstances that don't require consciousness as such. You could have robots that respond in a complicated way. But maybe if you have enough neurons, you have consciousness as a byproduct. Um, as, as an example of this, imagine, think about something like a molecule of water. And ask, well, is a molecule of water wet? <laughs> I think you probably <laughs> say that's not a meaningful question. I mean, how could a, one molecule be wet? How about two molecules? How about five, a hundred, a thousand? I, I don't know, probably not. I would guess that once you pile up a gazillion molecules of water, uh, uh, enough to have a tiny drop or something, or to reduce the friction between other objects, then we would probably say it's wet. If you have enough water molecules, you have wetness, but probably not, almost certainly not, because evolution has selected for wetness. It's just a consequence of having enough of those molecules in any one place. So sort of to extend your question, maybe then consciousness simply has evolved because of an unintended byproduct of having a, a whole lot of neurons in one place. I don't think that's a terribly interesting outcome, but it could be that that's what's going on. Is that Maybe what, our like, consciousness doesn't really mean much at all. Is that the sort of thing that Daniel Dennett talks about when he says consciousness is the, the hum of all of our mental machinery working together? Yeah, that's right. I think that's right. That would be, you know, he's, he's more inclined to that view. He doesn't deny the possibility of consciousness, but he claims that it's essentially kind of the background consequence of everything else that's going on. I take a more, I don't know what the term would be, sort of a more proactive evolutionary view. I think there are a number of genuine adaptive, sort of positive adaptive significances to consciousness that we can at least hypothesize about. It's not very easy to prove. Like what? Well, for, for instance, um, and I think perhaps the most interesting one for me, if you, if you try to combine, because it's derived from combining looking at evolution and looking at animal and human social behavior, in a 
highly social species, and we certainly are that, it's really important for us to be concerned, if you will, with how we present ourselves to others. And I think that part of the definition of consciousness may be relevant here. Like, I, we have two German Shepherd dogs, and they're both incredibly aware, responsive to the environment. Their ears are perked, they're up, they're ready, they're, you know, responding to all sorts of, much more, they're much more aware of their environment than I am, and much more responsive. I'm not sure that they're conscious in the sense of being aware of being aware. No meta-awareness? I don't think there's meta-awareness there, although I don't know for sure. But I think human beings do have meta-awareness, to be aware of being aware, and that's kind of what I mean by consciousness. And I think if you're a social species, being aware of how you are being perceived by others is extremely important in terms of helping you to essentially to titrate your own behavior in a way that makes you come across as well as possible. And so, I mean, in some ways, I, I actually call this a, sort of the Robbie Burns phenomenon. After one of Robert Burns' poems where he talks about uh, what's, what's the one the gift to give us to see ourselves as others see us, that it may be that part of the adaptive significance of consciousness is that enables us essentially to see ourselves as others see us and hence to present ourselves in a way that is maximally acceptable to others, which may involve inhibiting some of our inclinations. It may involve misrepresenting ourselves in some ways. So that, I mean, it <laughs> results in a rather cynical view in some ways that our, our vaunted consciousness is, in some respects, perhaps, a consequence of deception. It's evolution's way to get us to work in our social surroundings and our communities. It just helps us out in that way? Yeah, yeah. It's a way in which, I mean, if uh, Sigmund Freud was talking about it, a way in which we're able to sort of hide our id in a, in a way that makes us more acceptable to others and represent ourselves in ways that are uh, more pro-social. But, and by the way, that's not, I think, the only possible adaptive value of consciousness. Another one that, that I think re deserves some attention is the opportunity to um, examine a circumstance, examine an op a, a uh, possible variety of options, and work through the consequences of behavior without actually doing the behavior. By, by virtue of what I think is consciousness or close to it, we can imagine, envisage circumstances without actually living them out and then try to anticipate whether the outcome is good or not. We can think things through, then, is what you mean? Yeah, I guess. That's, I think you said it much more, much more succinctly. Yeah, it's kind of trial and error in our heads instead of having to actually do it all the time in the real world. In your book, Madame Bovary's Ovaries, the Darwinian look at literature, is that the sort of thing you're getting at? Is literature on the page, this thinking things through, this running through of scenarios, and that's what benefits humans who read it? Well, it's an interesting point, Colin. I think that's certainly one of the potential adaptive significances, if you will, of literature or of storytelling in general, um, which is certainly a widespread human trait. I would guess it's a universal human trait. The whole notion of telling stories um, is a, an intriguing evolutionary puzzle. Why do we do that? And as you suggest, one possibility may well be to sort of run through scenarios. Maybe when we read stories or talk about or hear myths, it's a way in which we are able to essentially um, run through scenarios without actually experiencing them literally. And in that sense, learn from them, not unlike uh, kittens, you know. <laughs> you know, we always we see kittens batting around a ball of wool, and we love it, we watch it, we enjoy it. They're clearly having a good time. If, if pushed, we're likely to say that they're probably learning how eventually to catch mice, because the money and the movements are very much like what they do then. Uh, and it could be it's something like that when we hear stories or tell them. I wanted to address the thorny issue of free will that you also bring up in Natural Selections. Now, you, you say that you're not a genetic determinist. You believe more in the influence of our genes rather than their determination of our lives. What is the, what is the difference there? 
Well, I think it's the difference between shooting a bullet at a target, say at close range, where it's likely to go pretty much where you aimed it, and throwing a dart that's very light that has a lot of feathers in a strong wind. So that you may <laughs> wind up hitting the target, but you may wind up missing. Um. You don't. It, there isn't that much control in, in the human case for most behavior. Um, unlike that of many other animals, for which things are quite limited in their in the possible outcome. But what's an interesting paradox here is that, although, as you say, I certainly believe that we're we're really talking about genetic influence for, for human beings in in most cases. I mean, clearly, for something like eye color, it's not genetic influence; it's really genetic determinism. But for something like um, human creativity, there's genetic influence and very little determinism. But part of the, what, what's an intriguing paradox that arises when you raise the question of free will, because on a biological level, and indeed a level of any, any scientific level, it's essentially impossible to believe in free will. If you accept that Things are caused by other things. That whenever something happened, it's caused by some preceding circumstance. And this should apply to our neurons no less than to billiard balls. And so if, the, if that which is consciousness or intent in humans is a result of neurons interacting with each other and electrochemical events of all sorts that we're just beginning to really understand, all of these things are caused by something else. There's calcium ions and, and all sorts of other ions that flow back and forth between neurons. And this is what we mean, ultimately, what produces in some way consciousness and behavior and intent. Then how can there be any behavior that is meaningfully free? doesn't fit in that framework. It doesn't fit at all. And yet, the irony is, I'm as much a rigid materialist as anyone I know, and yet I go about my life assuming that I do have free will. And in fact, I assume that you do, and yeah, <laughs> that everyone I, else I guess in my so. life. <laughs> yeah, and so there's a real paradox here. I know, at some level, I know there cannot be free will, and yet, at another level, I know that I, <laughs> at least, I'm convinced that I have it, and I treat everyone else around me as though they do too. The image of an actual individual, a human, going around saying, "I don't have free will," it just seems absurd on the face of it. That's right. That's right. And certainly self-defeating. I mean, <laughs> you know, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. I guess if you really think you don't have free will, uh, maybe you don't, but I don't know what, who's pulling your strings in that case. But it, it, it is strange, because if you take the, material, the materialist view to its extreme, which, again, I'm inclined to do, um, what would be behavior that was totally disconnected from its previous circumstances? That is to say, true free will. In order to have real free will, you have to have something that's not caused by what happened earlier. And so it seems to me one example of that would be something like oh, spontaneous radioactive decay. You know, we, mm -hmm. we know you can look at radioactive isotopes, and you know that if you have enough of these atoms together in one place, you can predict what proportion will have decayed at a given time, but you can't predict whether any given isotope, any given nucleus is going to do that, okay? That, that's as close, I think, in the material world as we have to random this. When will something throw off a, a beta particle and when will it not? But if that's what we mean by spontaneity or free will, I mean, pure randomness, that doesn't, that doesn't <laughs> seem to meet the bill either, does it? So we only, know, we only know strict determinism and we know randomness. We don't have the mental concept of another way. I think that's right. That's well put. We don't have that medium way, except, <laughs> ironically, maybe that's what we really have. <laughs> you know, we just don't have a term for it. Yeah. It, get back, it gets back to the part in your book about how, I believe the chapter is uh, Believing is Seeing, about how phenomena don't, uh, a phenomenon doesn't necessarily make its way into the scientific worldview unless there's a space for it in the existing framework. Yes, yes, that's exactly right, and it's, it's peculiar because we think of science, and scientists, and I think correctly so, as being open to new ideas and understanding things in the world. 
Um, and yet, I think the evidence is pretty clear at this point that unless we have, as you say, sort of a framework, unless there's intellectual theoretical space for something, in many ways we literally don't see it. It's as though we don't really acknowledge the existence of many phenomena until we already have a theoretical explanation for it. And then we begin to perceive it. Do you think there could ever be circumstances under which the free will question would be answerable? Oh, boy. That's a great question. Uh, that is a very grand question, I know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in the same way, I guess what's, what's really equivalent to that Colin is asking is there... Um, how could one really nail down the neurobiology of consciousness hmm. or of intentionality, of subjective experience? I, 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 I suspect that in the long run it could be done. I'm very hesitant to say that there's anything that, by way of, of um, scientific insight that could not be obtained. But when it comes to that question of sort of bridging what seems to be this extraordinary gulf between the subjective whether it's consciousness or uh, creative thought or whatever, whatever you want to call it, and physical events, I think for all the advances we've made, I think we're still astoundingly far from answering that. It's because the reality is I couldn't even tell you what sort of finding I would need in order to satisfy myself that that's been answered. Not only do I not think it's been done yet, but I don't even know, I can't even predict the outline of what it would look like. It's so far off from the framework we have that it's just, it's, it's an abstraction of an abstraction of an abstraction, etc. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 can't even, I can't even conceive of, this out, of, of the basic shape. I mean, imagine some, some neurobiologist were to say, okay, here it is, Consciousness, I found that it is a <laughs> particular amino acid, you know, that is constructed in just this way. And if we look at it in different species, we find that the species with more consciousness has more of it. Not only that, we find that when an individual is asleep, it tends to go away, and when an individual is awake, it pops up again. And it's really intense and very creative, aware people, and there's less of it, blah, blah, blah. But it's this chemical. Here it is. Here's the molecule. That's just what the one thing identified right there. There it yeah. is. Yeah, imagine if that were the case. It's hard to picture. It's not only hard to picture, but even if that were the case, it's hard for me to imagine. Yeah, it's hard to picture what that would translate into in reality. It's what hard to picture how how would anybody change as a result of that discovery? What how would people's way of thought change afterward? Would it change? Yeah, would it change? Or and moreover, what would it mean to say that this is this is the molecule of consciousness? Yeah, right. we're getting a little heavy here. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. Well, let me ask a little lighter question. What does toilet training tell us about the possibility of free will? Yes, that's a favorite example of mine, and I think it's <laughs> it is lighter, and yet it has some real implications. Yeah, light and deep. Yeah, one of the things that um, I'm concerned about when I speak to students uh, or when I write about evolution is that people will come away with the rather depressing notion that we human beings are entirely at the mercy of our evolutionary past, uh, and that whatever you think about free will, that we are nonetheless condemned to follow the dictates of our DNA legacy. And I think um, a useful way to get out of this mindset um, is to think about something as parochial as housebreaking an animal and toilet training a human being and ask, why is it, and a lot of people have never asked this question, <laughs> why is it that it's so much easier to housebreak a dog or a cat than it is to toilet train a human being? It's a good question. I mean, I, you know, I'm, I'm supposed to be an expert in animal behavior, and I know, know a fair amount about it, but I don't have, you don't have to be an expert in animal behavior to be able to housebreak a dog or a cat. I can do that usually in an afternoon or less. Whereas my children took, you know, on average about three years. <laughs> and I'd like to think that my children are at least as smart or smarter than my dogs or cats. If you ask yourself, why is, this, why is there this rather dramatic and somewhat counterintuitive difference? Yeah. I think if we look to evolution, we can understand it. Namely, dogs and cats evolved in a two-dimensional world. And it clearly was not in their interest to befoul their dens. 
And so they were, they have evolved along with a, a, a very ready inclination to learn more appropriate toilet habits. Human beings, on the other hand, of course, evolved in the trees. We're primates. And like all other primates, it's very difficult to toilet train or housebreak an animal that evolved in the trees for whom uh, their, their toilet habits are not their problem, you know? Yeah, we didn't need it back then. No, it's the, the, the poor creatures down on the ground who may have to worry about what's going on <laughs> up in the trees. But, and that's why, in fact, uh, uh, one of the reasons why an ape or a monkey makes a terrible pet, among other things, is that you have to have diapers on them all the time. So that's why I see the diapers on the monkeys. Or they poop all over the house. Huh. Yeah, they, they cannot be, be housebroken or toilet trained. But, and this is, this, this is the optimistic part now, Let's get back to, to human beings. Right. I mean, does that mean that it's hopeless? Does that mean that human beings, because we're primates, evolved in the trees, um, are incapable of being toilet trained? Well, you know, I, I would submit that everyone listening to this broadcast is toilet trained. Uh, I would hope. I would hope. I mean, you, you have a reasonably you know, advanced audience. <laughs> I'm hoping so, yes. Yeah. Well, and, and so and I think, honestly, I mean, <laughs> in all seriousness, the, the fact that that Homo sapiens, a perfectly good primate, is capable of being toilet trained is something to celebrate. <laughs> By which yeah, I, and yeah. I don't just mean in terms of sort of daily hygiene, but in terms of what it says about our ability to modify our behavior once, uh, the issues are made clear to us. And I guess I, as an evolutionary biologist, as well as a peace activist, frankly, remain somewhat optimistic that a species of primate that can be toilet trained could eventually be planet trained, too. It's an example that gives you a little bit of hope, counterintuitively, <laughs> true. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I think it's something um, that we can look, look forward to. <laughs> look forward to the, the eventual toilet training of Homo sapiens. <laughs> the sort of grand, overarching toilet <laughs> training. Now, you're a scientist, and you have an interest in philosophy in your books. You, you bring up Hume, Aristotle, Socrates, Hobbes, um, Ber um, Isaiah Berlin, one of my very favorites, and Kant in Madame Bovary's Ovaries. Now, I, uh, I have a friend who's in college right now. He's a double major, biology and philosophy, Coincidentally, and he's he's had a lot of he's had a struggle because he doesn't know which one to pick in graduate school. How how do you reconcile your interests? How do they work together for you? <sighs> well, I think the main way they work together right now is in fact in informing the writing that I do, and one really does help illuminate the other. I mean, I see I do see myself as more a biologist than a philosopher but I am increasingly intrigued by the wisdom that comes not only from biology, but from looking at the human situation in other ways. I would, I would urge your friend to try to pursue both. I think the connections between biology and philosophy are increasingly uh, recognized, including the issue of consciousness. It's very interesting that both biologists and philosophers are some of the major contributors in this area. And certainly the issue of bioethics is in increasingly important. It's at the intersection of these two ideas of philosophy and biology that you think the action is? Well, I'm not sure it's the action. I think there will be a lot of action. So do you hear that, Chris? David Barish tells you to go into both. <laughs> I'll be sure to pass this along to him. Now, we're a little over time, but I want to ask you one more thing, because I think this is I think it's going to be controversial a little bit. I think it's going to interest people, but in your book you state your position as being for the eventual hybridization of man and animal, of the mixing of genes between man and the other animals. Yeah, there ha <laughs> and it has indeed been controversial. There has been a lot of response to that, and what I said basically in that, in that chapter is that I would be very much in favor of the hybrid, eventual hybridization between, say, human beings and chimpanzees. What would that do for us? Well, I think what it would do would be, again, profoundly helpful. It would make it very, very difficult, if not impossible, for people to argue in favor of a, what I have called the most hurtful myth of all time, the myth that there is a, an absolute discontinuity between human beings and the rest of the living world. If we were to produce, and I have no doubt that in the not-too-distant future it will be possible, whether people will actually do it, I don't know, to produce genuine, viable 
human-chimp hybrids, they're called human Z's. If you know, <laughs> wow. <laughs> that um, once that happens, I don't understand how a religious fundamentalist could claim that there are human beings over here on the one side and then totally disconnected is, are, are, are all the other living forms. If we know anything from evolution, it's continuity. And I think the fact of that continuity, if actually ma made manifest, would be enormously helpful. The fundamentalist could not deny the human Z standing in the corner. I don't see how they could. <laughs> and, and beyond, you know, and that whole weird notion, to me, weird notion that human beings possess a soul, whatever that is, and that other living things don't. Again, I see that as a totally unjustified uh, act of hubris that flies in the face of everything that, from evolutionary biology that we know. Now, actually, there have been some people who, uh, you know, my suggestion is a little bit tongue-in-cheek, <laughs> but not entirely. <laughs> you know, um, there are some people who have confronted me for, well, you know, what would it be, wouldn't it be terrible to be one of these hybrids? And I'm not at all sure that that would be true. It might be very gratifying for a person, if you will, to be able to swing eagerly and avidly through the trees. That's what I was envisioning. As soon as you said that, I was like, swinging through the trees. That's yeah, what I would do. That would be wonderful. Or, alternatively, maybe it would be immensely gratifying for what would otherwise be a chimpanzee to be able to write poetry. Hmm, a chimpanzee poetry. That's, <laughs> I, I like that vision of the future. Humans swinging through the trees and chimpanzees doing poetry. It's, it, there you go. Yeah, and may, maybe they'll learn lessons about nukes as well. That's right. <laughs> Let's hope so. Well, David Barish, thanks so much for joining us. You're welcome, Colin. It's been fun. Our music is composed by Ben Althaus. He also goes under the names Ice Ben and DJ Concept. Check out his website, www.benalthouse, that's B-E-N-A-L-T-H-O-U-S-E, dot com. Find our complete show archive, our Frapper map, and more on our website, www.colinmarshallradio.com, slash marketplace.